All right, that's all. As you know, not too long ago, we started to discuss the Trinity, the fact that God is one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We discussed the deity of Jesus Christ. We discussed the relationship between God the Father and the Son. And now tonight, I would like us to consider the work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in our salvation. I've simply entitled the lesson, Salvation is God's Gracious Work. Salvation is God's work. We don't work to save ourselves. God does the work. And it is the work not only of God the Father, but it's also the work of God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So all three persons of the Godhead are involved in my salvation and in your salvation. Well, what does this tell us? It tells us that God is wise. When we look at what God the Father does and what God the Son does and what God the uh, Holy Spirit does, we have to stand back and, and just say, wow, the wisdom of God is amazing. And it also means we have a very full, a very complete salvation. Our total salvation is just that. It's total. It's full. It's complete. It's complex. Every detail about our salvation has been worked out by God, whether by God the Father, whether it's accomplished by God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. No detail of our salvation has been overlooked. You know how it is with us. We're doing something. We forget. We leave something out. We misplace something. Well, God doesn't do that when it comes to our salvation. Every detail about our salvation has been thought out by God so that we have a perfect salvation. God doesn't give us something defective or half done. The salvation he gives us accomplished by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is absolutely perfect. So with that in mind, let's consider, number one, the work of the Father. And all of these references are in Ephesians. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians. And of course, we could go all over the Bible. We could go all over the New Testament to talk about the work of God the Father. But I'm just going to be brief tonight, just to share a few thoughts about the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now let's consider the work of God the Father in bringing about our salvation. So let's go to letter A. Letter A. God is the one, God the Father, purposes and plans my salvation. You might say salvation starts in the heart and mind of God the Father. So if you will, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. So let me just start reading here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, that is God the Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, God the Father, chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us, now this is still the work of God the Father in verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, the grace of God the Father, by which he, that is God the Father, has made us accepted in the beloved. No doubt the beloved is the beloved one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I read that, you noticed all the work that God the Father was doing. And that work started in eternity past. God the Father predestined us. He set his love upon us. He chose us. He elected us in eternity past. And through uh, his work in our lives, uh, he brought in the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately to go to the cross, pay for our sins, so that we could receive the adoption as sons. God has given us this placement in his family so that he regards us as his son, and it's all on the basis of what Jesus did for us, so that we can be accepted before him. God the Father accepts us before him, in the merits of the beloved one, Jesus Christ. So there's a lot there packed into those uh, few verses, but I think we understand that uh, salvation has been purposed and it has been planned out 
by God the Father for us. Letter B. So it is God the Father who shows us his love and his grace. So if we will go over to chapter 2 now, for this point, chapter 2. Still in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. So here we read in chapter 2, verse 4, but God, and I would assume that means God the Father, but God, God the Father, who is rich in mercy because of what? His great love with which he loved us. So it's the, the love of God the Father that's coming to us that's going to save us. Uh, verse 5 says, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And I would assume that's the grace of God the Father. And then when we get down to, uh, say, verse um, 8, it says there, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And again, I would assume that's the grace of God the Father. No doubt that grace is mediated through Jesus. So we have God's grace coming to us. It's by God's love. It's by God's grace that we have been saved. So then we get on to point C. God the Father is the one who makes us alive. So if you will, just back up to verse 5. Uh, back, back up to verse 5. But even when we were dead in trespasses, uh, he, that is God the Father, he made us alive. He quickened our spirit, in other words. He made us alive together with Christ. And then verse 6 goes on to say, yes, God the Father not only made us alive, but in verse 6, he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he, that is God the Father, might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So again, I think you understand all the work that God the Father is doing. He is showing us his love. He is showing us his grace. He is... Uh, made us alive. He has raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places, and he is the one that's going to show the riches of his grace toward us throughout all eternity. And that kindness and grace comes to us, no doubt, through the Lord Jesus Christ, but it all starts and comes from God the Father. And then letter D, the last point here, letter D. Uh, the text says that we're God's workmanship. We're the workmanship of God the Father. So notice uh, verse 10. It says there, for we are his. That's the workmanship of God the Father. We're his workmanship. In other words, God the Father is working on me. As a result of uh, exercising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive the gift of God's salvation. And that means I'm, I'm the work project of God the Father. You might say I'm his masterpiece. I'm his craftsmanship. I've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God, God the Father, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should live in good works. So, again, we just see how involved God the Father is in our salvation. He's done so much. And, of course, we can go on throughout the New Testament looking at all the things that God the Father does. But suffice it to say, God the Father works to accomplish and bring about our salvation. So now, number two, let's go on and consider the work of God the Son. The work of the Son. So now we can go to 1 John. All of these references are in 1 John. So let's consider the work of God the Son in bringing about our salvation. So if you will, go to 1 John in the New Testament. 1 John. And we'll start with letter A. Letter A. So what does the Son do? The Son is the one who reveals the Father's love. Yes, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we get sinners. Uh, Christ died for us. So we see the love. Love comes from God the Father. God the Father is the source of love, and Jesus is the one who reveals and shows us the great and awesome and wonderful love of God the Father. So the Son is the revealer of God. He shows us who God is and what God is like, and in particular, he shows us the love of the Father. So let's read this reference now. 1 John chapter 4 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. 1 John 4 and verse 9. In this, in this act, the love of God, that's the love of God the Father, was manifested toward us. The love of God the Father was shown to us, it was revealed to us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him, that we might live through the Son. 
And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we learn in these verses that God manifests his love. He shows us his love by sending his son into the world. So as we look at the son, as we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we can say, wow, I know the love of God because of Jesus. I know the love of God because Jesus has come into the world. I know the love of God because Jesus went to the cross and he died for me. He died for you. He paid for our sins. So that's letter A. So letter B, what does the son do? Letter B, the son pays for my sins. Same reference, 1 John 4 verses 9 to 10. We'll use the same verses. But notice in verse 10, uh, the Apostle John says, and this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and he sent his son into the world to be what? To be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, Jesus, the son of God, is that final, all-sufficient sacrifice that satisfies God's demands that my sins be judged and punished. And God the Father accepts the sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf. God the Father is pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf, so that all who put their faith and trust in Christ are able to avert and to avoid God's judgment and God's wrath on their sins. So Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He paid for my sins. He paid for your sins. So that's how God the Father works to accomplish our salvation. It is through the work of Jesus uh, being the Lamb of God on behalf of my sin. All right, let us see. What else does the Son do? The Son intercedes for me. If you will, go to 1 John chapter 2, if you will. 1 John chapter 2. So the Son not only died for me to be the, be, to be, uh, the one who paid for my sins, but the Son also lives for me. He's been raised from the dead, and he has a ministry for me right now. He has a ministry for you right now. So in 1 John chapter 2, uh, notice, if you will, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Yeah, that's it. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you that you do not sin, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we have a, you might say, a defense lawyer with God the Father. Uh, we have someone who speaks to the Father in my defense. Even when I sin, and I believe God the Father... Uh, is reminded that Jesus paid for all of my sins, every last one of them, so that even as a Christian, if we sin, we don't lose our salvation. Uh, we're not uh, expunged from, from God's uh, gift of eternal life that he's given to us. And so uh, we can go to letter D. Uh, so Jesus not only intercedes for me, that's his present ministry, but letter D, he gives me hope. So if you look across the page to chapter 3, chapter 3 and verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, in other words, when Jesus, the Son of God, is revealed, we shall be like him, we shall be like Jesus, we shall be like the Son, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, in other words, this hope of seeing Jesus at the second coming and being like him, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. In other words, the second coming of Jesus motivates me to keep my life clean, knowing that Jesus is coming, and he's coming for me. So the work of God the Father in his death on the cross and in his resurrection and in his promise to come again gives me hope. He gives me hope. And I rest assured, and I have the confidence that my salvation uh, will be fully completed, that my salvation will be brought to a consummation, because I will be like Jesus. Um, I will see him and be like him. And what am I going to see? What is it that's so astounding when Jesus comes back? I've often thought about this and have wondered what it is that we're going to see about Jesus and what it is that we're going to be like. After all, we're not going to be like Jesus so much so that we're going to become God. No, we're not going to become deity. But we'll certainly have new resurrection bodies like that of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and we won't be bothered by the presence of sin anymore. I've often thought, too, that even as Jesus was loved by God the Father for all eternity, we're going to see Jesus. And we're going to see Jesus in glory. And we're going to know how much God the Father loves Jesus. And we're going to know when we see Jesus how much loved we are as well. We're going to appreciate as never before when Jesus comes back how much God the Father loves me and how much God the Son loves me as well. So this is the hope that we have. So this is just a few things that the God the Son does on our behalf to bring about our salvation. Truly amazing, truly wonderful. Well, let's move on to the third point and consider the work of God the Holy Spirit. And I've just listed a uh, about four things here as well, uh, just to uh, emphasize that the Holy Spirit does a lot in our lives. We don't want to forget about the work of the Holy Spirit. So we have a number of references here. So I've jotted down about four things the Spirit does. No doubt there's more things we could list that the Holy Spirit does. But letter A, I'll start there. Letter A, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. So I believe that the Holy Spirit works in the hearts and lives of people as they hear the gospel, as they hear the good news. The Holy Spirit, I believe, starts to work in a sovereign and mysterious way to convict unbelievers of their sin, uh, to convict them that Jesus truly is the way. He's righteous. He's pure. He's the Son of God. And to uh, just show them that apart from Christ, uh, they are under the judgment of God. So I believe the Holy Spirit has a convicting work in the hearts and lives of people as they hear the gospel. So if you want, go to the gospel of John chapter 16. The gospel of John chapter 16. So letter A, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. In other words, the Holy Spirit shows me of my need for a Savior. I believe the Holy Spirit works to impress upon me the truthfulness of the gospel, to impress upon me the claims of Christ. So let me read this now. This is John chapter 16. Notice verse 8. John 16, verse 8. And when he has come, that's the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Well, I think the greatest sin of all is to reject Jesus, the sin of unbelief. So that's the sin that the Holy Spirit convicts us of. It's not right to disbelieve Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit motivates us to believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit uh, shows us that Jesus is righteous. He truly came from the Father. He's going back to the Father. And then the Holy Spirit convicts us uh, that we are under the judgment of God unless we believe in Jesus as our Savior. So I think that's an important ministry of the Spirit. Uh, so whenever, whenever the gospel is preached, we want to uh, just pray that the Holy Spirit would work in hearts and lives of people to soften their hearts and make them receptive to the good news of Jesus. All right, going on to letter B now. In the lives of believers, the Holy Spirit shows the Father's love. Uh, letter B, the Holy Spirit shows the Father's love. And for this, we can go to uh, Romans uh, chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. So keep in mind, the Holy Spirit is a gift given uh, from God the Father, and I believe from God the Son, to everyone who believes. At the moment of saving faith, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And just by virtue of God giving us this gift, God is in effect saying, I love you. I'm giving you this gift. After all, we, we give gifts to people we love. We give gifts to people that uh, we appreciate. And so God the Father is giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, in effect, says, I love you. I'm giving the gift of my Holy Spirit. My Spirit will be with you. My Spirit will be in you. My Spirit will work in your heart and your life. So notice now Romans 5 and verse 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because... The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the Holy Spirit is in itself a, an expression of God's great love for us. And also, I believe the Holy Spirit, once given to us, works in my life and works in your life to help us to appreciate 
the wonderful love of God. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand and to value God's love. It helps us understand how, how great and how deep and how mighty is the love of God. And so that's an important ministry of the Spirit. All right, let us see. What else does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit is given to us as a seal, you might say. The Holy Spirit seals us. And we'll look at this reference. This is back in Ephesians. So let's go back to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1, if you will, again. For the seal, we might think of, I always like to use the illustration out west, when, when a rancher has a lot of cattle, they often brand the cattle. They put a seal or a stamp or a mark on the hide of the cattle. So the cattle are all identified. They, they, they know who the owner of those cattle belong to. Um, and so the cattle don't get mixed up in case they're all out grazing uh, in the same pasture or whatever. So notice now, if you will, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, referring to Jesus, in him you trusted. In, in Jesus you trusted. Uh, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom having believed, that's referring to Jesus again, having believed in Jesus, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God gave us the Holy Spirit the moment we put our faith and trust in Christ, and that Holy Spirit was meant to be a mark of ownership. God is saying, you, you belong to me. Um, you're mine, and I've put my, my stamp of ownership on you. Verse 14 goes on to say, referring to the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee. Notice that now, the Spirit. Having the Spirit having been given to us is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of his glory. So there in verse 14, our, our future salvation, or the completion of our salvation is spoken of as a future inheritance, and the Holy Spirit guarantees our salvation. The Holy Spirit... As, as it were, promises that we'll receive God's full and complete salvation. Uh, nothing will fall short, nothing will be missing, will, our salvation will be brought indeed to a culmination. So that's the work of the Spirit, sealing us, giving us the certainty of our salvation. One final point, letter D, what else does the Holy Spirit do? And this is a really big point, the Holy Spirit transforms me, he transforms you. He changes us into Christ's likeness. So when we become believers on the basis of the shed blood of Christ and the death and resurrection of Christ, God gives us the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit works in my life and the Holy Spirit works in your life so that we become different people. We start sinning less and less and we start obeying God more and more. Our minds and our attitudes are changed. Our heart has changed. Our actions have changed. And I just put down one reference here. Galatians 5. So if you want to just turn the page backwards, just go back one page in your Bible, and you're there in a, uh, Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 5. And this is known as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So this is what the Holy Spirit's doing in my life and what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life. So Galatians 5 verse 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So amen, praise be to God. Christians are to be a changed people because God the Father purposes and plans our salvation. He shows us his love through Jesus. Jesus dies on the cross, pays for all of our sins, raised from the dead, intercedes for us, and when we believe, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit does a lot of work in our lives. One of the great ministries of the Spirit is to change me and to conform me to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So again, when all is said and done, we say to ourselves, Wow, God, look at your wisdom revealed in your work, the work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Lord, when I think about the salvation you've given to me, accomplished by God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I say, wow, it's a good salvation. It's a big salvation. It's a salvation that's been perfectly planned out. No detail has been omitted. No blessing has been left aside. Everything has been thought out and planned perfectly by the Father and accomplished by God the Father himself, God the Son, 
and God the Holy Spirit. So as we think about this, just again realize the salvation that I have, the salvation that you have, it's just wonderful. I mean, I'm almost at a loss for words to say how good and how glorious it is. So let's unite our hearts in prayer and let's ask God to help us to appreciate more and more this salvation that we have. Let's pray. Lord God, we quiet our hearts and, and we're humbled to think that the salvation you have given to us has been accomplished and worked by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you've given to us a full, a complete, a complex salvation. Nothing missing, nothing short, nothing deficient. Everything that could have been thought of, Lord, you have thought of it. And this salvation defies and goes way beyond anything that any human being could possibly have thought of. So Lord, help us to love you tonight. Help us to serve you well. And help us to be a good testimony for you. And Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to keep changing all of us and to keep working in our lives to make us more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be honored and glorified. Bless each one that is here tonight, Lord. We pray this in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right.